Oh, <laughs> I didn't see you there sneaking up on me in stealth mode. I'm Andrew Reinhardt, I'm a video game archaeologist, and... Archaeogaming is the study of archaeology in and of video games. It's not just about finding game cartridges in a desert excavation, or how archaeologists and archaeology are presented in games. Watch out, Indy! In fact, archaeogaming is so much more. Just as there are dozens of flavors of archaeology, the same is true for archaeogaming. Everything from studying games as built environments and sites to conducting archaeological surveys within virtual worlds no one has ever seen before. There's archaeological reception and the ethics of conducting archaeology in digital spaces. We're going to take a look at what archaeogaming is. Consider this to be the demo of a game you're thinking about playing. Maybe in the end, you'll buy it. You might have heard about the excavation of the Atari Burial Ground in 2014, where hundreds of thousands of game cartridges were buried in a New Mexico landfill. That's real-world archaeogaming, but it really only scratches the surface of how we understand video game archaeology from the outside. This is an archaeological artifact. Now, somebody made this, and millions of copies were manufactured to become part of modern material culture. Even though this game is literally one in a million, it's also unique. It has a biography and a history of use. The game code contained on this disc was designed by Jason Jones. And uh, this was done for Bungie, uh, which was then published by Microsoft Game Studios. It was burned to a master, and that was soon manufactured into copies. Now, this copy was shipped to a big box store for a retail sale of around $60 where it waited for years before being marked down into a bargain bin, maybe around $10, $15, and then it was purchased by my neighbor and later sold at the community yard sale for a dollar, which is when I bought it because I'm a late adopter. I installed it on my PC, which I no longer own, that was recycled. And who knows what'll happen next to this game media. An artifact is a time traveler collecting history along the way. There's also an inner biography of games, which can be told through versions, updates, and patches. There are changes in the game's code that fix bugs, enhance existing features, and introduce new functionality. These changes typically are archived by the game's developer and are important to note when understanding a game's history within a wider context of gameplay and reception by players. This is Holy Ground. The video arcade cabinet, like Pac-Man here, used to be an altar at video arcades, sites of worship for players in the 1970s and 1980s prior to the adoption of home entertainment systems. Today many arcades have transitioned from places of worship to sites of pilgrimage, where players come to experience older games again and to introduce new and younger generations of players to these relics of coin-operated fun. Playing in this space, this site of pilgrimage, reminds me that not only are games parts of sites, like the dump in Alamogordo or in a working arcade, but the games themselves are actually their own archaeological sites. Oh my golly, this is uncharted territory! This isn't just a video game, this is an archaeological site! Go! Oh, what's next? I'm currently a humunculus, controlling the brain of Uncharted's protagonist, Nathan Drake. But I'm not playing as Nathan, I'm playing as my archaeologist self. The space I occupy is what archaeologists call a built environment. That means a space that people made for people to occupy and use. For video games, instead of building with wood, stone, and metal, the worlds they contain are made out of code. With a game like Uncharted, things pretty much appear as the designers intended, although you will occasionally find a game glitch, which is also an artifact. But what about other kinds of games that seem to design their own worlds as you play? Welcome to the universe of No Man's Sky, a game that uses algorithms and math to create a nearly infinite universe with a nearly infinite variety of worlds to explore. For the video game archaeologist, these games provide opportunities to conduct several varieties of actual archaeology, including survey, landscape, and even underwater. We can conduct our own garbology, analyzing trash in the landscape left by players as well as algorithms, 
and we're beginning to figure out how to create and use archaeological tools and methods in these virtual sites. This kind of automated world building brings us to the outer edge of Archeogaming's galaxy. Well, I just realized that studying video games from an archaeological perspective alters our perception of what's real and what's virtual. And it blends the two. It's like quantum physics, where in order to observe what happens inside a virtual world, I, I actually have to interact with that space. Even if I'm just standing around, the game reacts to my presence and in action. And if I do interact with the world by walking or by picking something up or collecting some dank herbs or shooting a bad guy, I'm actively making things happen by my agency. So, so I have to think carefully. It's, it's reflexive. People build things or they build things to make other things. As players, we'll almost never meet the creator of the worlds we inhabit. Someone created this Minecraft server and left it behind for others to use. Maybe the creator will come back, maybe not. But what we're left with is a space that we can explore and use however we like, within the rules prescribed by the game and the person or people who made it. They might have coded everything by hand, or they might have written algorithms to do it and to do the heavy lifting and to save on storage. In any case, what we're left with is a site that was built for others and built for us. But who are we, really? Oh, you know, as, as real-world archaeologists, we have a pretty good idea about who we are and what we do. But when it comes to video games, we still have a long way to go if we want to inject some reality into that fantasy. Archaeologists typically don't wear the Indiana Jones uniform, aren't good at parkour, and don't go on artifact retrieval missions sponsored by the local museum. The artifacts we find aren't magical or cursed, we don't loot anything, and what we do find, we don't trade with others or sell at the auction house. For better or worse, all of the above feature heavily in games with archaeology and archaeologists in them, and the developers' design and media have a mass effect on the general community of players. You see what I did there? So what can we do about it? Well, one way that we can control the archaeological narrative in games is to design some games of our own. On the laptop here, I'm using some free Twine software to create some interactive fiction, which is something that anybody can do without having to learn to code. But there are other ways, too. It's possible that archaeologists could consult with game developers on how archaeology really works, and who archaeologists really are, and how we behave. And part of that means making ourselves available and known to the development community, and part of that also means being willing to compromise on story and entertaining gameplay so we have something that is both interesting and fun, but also considers the ethics of archaeology. Archaeologists can also use games as teaching tools. Maybe you're playing one of the Civilization games, or in this case, the Talos Principle. Games that are set in antiquity, or that attempt to reconstruct or recreate history, lend themselves easily to a discussion of what's right, what's wrong, and what's a mixture of the two. Can we play an alternate historical timeline? And how might that compare with what actually happened in the past? How faithful does the 3D reconstruction of a building or weapon in a game need to be to the original? And what is the purpose of photorealistic imagery in these kinds of games? With augmented reality games like Pokemon Go here, um, Players can get out in the real world and learn more about their surroundings, which can include cultural heritage. While it's a stretch to think that players will play general AR games in historical settings, it's possible for heritage sites and for organizations to add AR content for the people who want it, making it as fun, as informative as they like. There's something over here. Oh, look! Well, what we have here is a piece of material culture. And for archaeologists, material culture basically means all the stuff that was used by people in a particular place and time. Now, in games, it's common to find artifacts uh, as we play. 
and sometimes the stuff is just lying around. And other times, weapons, armor, food items, money are dropped when we slay an enemy. So these items make up the material culture tied to the lore of people, or of a place, or of a time within the game itself. And sometimes when a game's really fun, the community or developers create real-world manifestations of in-game material culture like this Minecraft sword. You've heard at least one fictitious archaeologist shout, This belongs in a museum! And in some cases, the games that we play actually have museums in them. Games in the Elder Scrolls series use museums as gaming locations for players to use in quests, to loot, or to donate to. In this case, Bioshock Infinite has a kind of meta-museum dedicated to concept art from the game, presented in the form of paintings, sculptures, and even audio and video recordings. But that's not all. Over the past two years, real-world museums have begun to display artifacts of video game material culture. Museums such as the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York, have entire floors dedicated to game history. Other museums, such as Vagamas, the video game museum in Rome, are dedicated completely to video game hardware, software, and developer and player culture. And museums such as the Henry Ford Museum in Detroit, Michigan, have displays containing artifacts and even sand from the Atari burial ground in New Mexico. We've come full circle. I used to be really good at this game. This is uh, Sea Battle uh, for the Intellivision from 1980. And I actually grew up with an Intellivision. Um, and my brother and I would play, you know, whenever we could. After school, we played on the weekends. And, you know, basically, we've got nowadays uh, this kind of throwback device. This is a mini Intellivision that I got a couple of years ago. And this is also a lot like the Atari 2600 uh, mini that came out. And there's also a mini NES from Nintendo that's about to be released, too. Um, you know, nowadays we're seeing a popular resurgence in what's called retro gaming. Um, older players like me um, and uh, newer players who are interested in everything that's really 8-bit are combining nostalgia and historical curiosity and even a desire to look at the underlying code. Now, this might be a reaction to the complex photorealistic games of uh, modern computers and consoles, and it could also appeal to older generations of players who want to share their love of early gaming with their kids. All right, let's go get them. Retro gaming also features stores now dedicated to catering to the needs of collectors, selling original games, hardware, documentation, and peripherals. It's an open digital antiquities market with its own economy driven by supply and demand. Buyers, sellers, resellers. These are sold without context or a history of ownership, much like the Wild West days of selling antiquities from, well, antiquity. What can we learn from these transactions? and from renewed interest in 40-year-old bits of wafer and plastic. I don't know yet, but we'll find out. This is Argue Gaming. 